The words to which I should like to call your attention this evening are to be found in the chapter which we read together at the beginning, the first epistle of Peter, the first chapter, and verse 23, the 23rd verse in the first chapter of the first epistle of Peter. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And then he goes on to say, for all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Now, in many ways, this first chapter of this first epistle of Peter is uh, just a kind of extended disquisition on the whole subject of the gospel and the preaching of the gospel. You remember that in verse 12, he puts it to us like this, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. And here again at the end of the chapter, he seems to revert and to come back to this question of the gospel and the preaching of the gospel. This, he says, is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Now that makes us therefore once more consider the whole purpose of the preaching of the gospel as to what it is and as to why we should meet together thus and listen to it and consider it. Now these first Sunday nights of this new year 1959 we've been looking at this theme in general and picking out what seemed to be the first and the most important and vital things. There are certain things that we should always be aware of and should consider very serious. We've taken a general view of the gospel. We've considered the soul of men. The gospel is concerned about our souls. That's the crucial question. What shall it profit a man though he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? The gospel is interested in men's souls, not so much primarily in their bodies. It does have an interest in their bodies, but that isn't its primary interest. It's in the soul. This imperishable, immortal part of men. That's the business of the gospel. And then last Sunday evening we were considering together the absolute centrality and cruciality of the death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now here this evening we come to another aspect and another matter which is of central importance. And the apostle puts it here in a most interesting manner. He gives us here some reasons for listening to the gospel. The first of a writing reason, the greatest reason of all, is that this is the word of the Lord. That is uh, the ultimate reason for preaching this message. It isn't a man's word. I'm not here to voice my views and opinions or to indulge in my theorizings and philosophizings. That's not the business of Christian preaching. The word of the Lord, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. The only reason for a Christian church and for Christian preaching is that we claim that we are just expounders of the word of the living God. That's why we meet together in our troubles and predicaments 
at the present time, we are met together to consider what God has got to say about it all. We are tired of men's vices and of men's words, these babel vices. The world is full of them. They're shouting at us in the newspapers and the wireless television everywhere else. Isn't it time that at last the world began to listen to and to think about what God has to say concerning it all? Well, this, says the apostle, this gospel, this word which is preached unto you, is the word of God. And that's the first and the greatest reason for listening to it. But we have also seen that we are to listen to it and to pay attention to it because of what it tells us. Now, that was our theme last uh, Sunday evening. The apostle puts it here. Uh, he, he reminds us that the gospel tells us that we are redeemed not with gold or silver or anything like that, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. That's its great message to us. The message of redemption, the message of deliverance. And surely there is nothing that we are more urgently in need of than this very message of redemption. But there is another reason and a third reason which the Apostle adduces in this immediate context for, for listening to this gospel. And that is that we should listen to this word and to this gospel because of what it does. Now you notice he puts it like this. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by, by means of the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Now here I say he is emphasizing what it does, not its message to us so much as what it does itself, what it achieves and what it brings to pass. And it is here we come across this great central truth to which I am so anxious to call your attention this evening. For here again there is great and serious misunderstanding concerning this whole question. I mean the question of the rebirth. The question of being born again. It is one of the central doctrines and teachings of this Christian faith. And as we've seen with the doctrine of the death of Christ and the doctrine concerning the soul and its condition and its destiny in the sight of God. Here again is a truth that is ignored and neglected and not understood. And as long as men and women are not clear about this, well then they cannot hope to be Christian, because it is one of the first principles in connection with the Christian faith. Very well then, let me hurry to put it to you in the form of a number of propositions this evening. Here is the first. The gospel announces and gives a new birth. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Now this, of course, this new birth, this talk about being born again, is one of the great New Testament terms. Everybody remembers, surely, the story of Nicodemus and his interview with our Lord on that famous evening, that famous night, and how our Lord turned to him and said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It's crucial, you see. It's no use discussing these other matters with me, says our Lord to Nicodemus, in effect. You must be born again. But it's not only there. You find it constantly. Our Lord tells the woman of Samaria that that is her greatest need. 
Whosoever, he says, drinketh of this water, pointing to the well, shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him as a well of water springing up into everlasting life. It's the same thing. And then listen to, to our Lord putting it once more in the tenth chapter of that gospel according to St. John. I am come, he says, that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. What is this Christianity? Well, says the Apostle Paul in turn, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, a new creation. That's Christianity. If any man be in Christ, this is the truth about him, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Peter puts it here, he puts it again in his second epistle where he says that a Christian is one who has become a partaker of the divine nature. James says it in his gospel. He says again that we are born and brought into life and being by this word of God that is engrafted into us. That is the thing he tells us that makes us Christian. We are produced, he, by his own will, begat he us by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creature. And you get it in the epistles of John in exactly the same manner. Now, he says, beloved, now are we the children of God. That's what makes us Christians. That's what a Christian is. Well, now then, you see, this is something which is clearly very central and vital in connection with this Christian message and this Christian faith. And yet, how often is this realized? How often do you hear people talking about being born again, about being created anew, about being regenerated? You know, the average man in his notion of Christianity not only does not talk about this, if you, if you mention it to him, he will object to it. He'll be annoyed at it. There is nothing that so infuriates the natural man as this idea that he needs to be born again. Nicodemus, as you remember, objected to it, ridiculed it. How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb? Ridicule, sarcasm. And so the world has continued either to ignore this altogether or to treat it thus with sarcasm and with ridicule. Why? Well, it doesn't need much uh, critical acumen to answer that question. The answer is perfectly simple. Mankind will persist in thinking that Christianity primarily is a life to be lived. Isn't that the average man's notion about being a Christian? Ah, oh, he says there's that great book, the Bible. It's got a lot of teaching in it. Ten Commandments in the Old Testament. Sermon on the Mount in the New Testament. What's Christianity? What's a Christian? Oh, well, they say a Christian is a man who tries to put these principles into practice. You make yourself a Christian by living a good life. And so, you see, men are regarded as outstanding Christians who have just taken the so-called Christian ethic and who've been trying to put it into practice. And on a larger scale, we are confronted by this phenomenon that the newspapers are putting before us almost every day of the week. They seem to think that Christianity is something that you read in your New Testament, then put it into practice, that nations should do so. And they apply it in this whole question of war and all these things. You read the correspondence uh, pages and paragraphs in the various daily newspapers, and you'll always find people writing about that. What's needed, they say, is the application of Christian teaching. Why doesn't this country start and give an example of this, put it into operation? And that's their notion of Christianity. That Christianity primarily is a life to be lived in terms of and on the basis of 
the teaching, the ethical and moral teaching, especially of the New Testament. Well, now I want to try and show you once more what a complete misunderstanding of Christianity that is. That indeed, there is no greater travesty of Christianity than just that attitude. So the men who are applauded by the newspapers and regarded by the world as being outstanding Christians are the greatest enemies of the Christian truth. Let me prove my contention. The gospel of Jesus Christ in the first instance does not call upon us to try to practice and to live the Christian ethic. It doesn't do that. And it doesn't do it for this good reason. That it tells us that before we begin to do anything at all, we have a primary need. And that is the need of forgiveness. The gospel never comes to us as we are and says, well now look here. Uh, you, you must live a better life than that. You must uh, pull yourself together. You must read this scripture. You must begin to apply the Ten Commandments, Moral Law, Sermon on the Mount. Set off and do it. I defy anybody to show me where the gospel says that. It doesn't. That isn't its primary message. Its primary message is this. Repent and believe the gospel. The message of John the Baptist, who is the first preacher in the New Testament, was a message of repentance. We saw last Sunday night that our Lord himself after his resurrection and as he was sending out his own chosen disciples to preach the gospel, said, go and preach to all nations. Repentance and remission of sins in my name. Now that, you see, is the first call. Man, before he's called upon to do anything at all by this gospel, is told that he needs to be reconciled to God. He needs to be forgiven. He needs to be absolved from the guilt of his sin for this good reason. That he may not have time to live. That he may at any moment be ushered into the presence of God and stand at a bar of judgment. And that as he is, he cannot do so. So the gospel does not start by putting to us primarily an appeal to attempt to live its kind of life. Because it tells us that before we move or take a single action, our whole position in the presence of God is so desperately dangerous that our whole eternal destiny may be one of misery and of wretchedness and of pain. That's the first reason, then, why it doesn't start with this ethical appeal. But then in the second place, you see, it doesn't do that because it knows that there is nothing which is quite so hopeless as to do that. The gospel doesn't come to us and say, now look here, read the Sermon on the Mount and go out and try and live it, because it knows perfectly well that we cannot do so. Did you notice that in my text this evening? The apostle says here, being born again, and not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. What made him say that? Well, let me read the verses that come immediately before. Seeing, he says in verse 22, that you have purified your souls in obeying the truth of, being through, in obeying the truth through the Spirit and to unfeigned love of the brethren, See that ye love one another with a pure heart, fervently. And then at once he hurries on to say, being born again. You see the logic. Now says Peter, I am asking you to love your brethren with a pure heart, fervently, because you have been born again. Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. Now, that is typical New Testament teaching. The New Testament never calls a man to love another with a pure heart fervently unless he has been born again. Because it knows perfectly well that until he is born again, he simply cannot do it. 
It's sheer impossibility. Now look at this very command that we're looking at here. Can you make your heart pure? You're commanded to love with a pure heart. Can you purify your heart? Or let me take you back if you're interested in the Sermon on the Mount. Look at it. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Can you make yourself poor in spirit? Blessed are the meek. Can you make yourself meek? Have you ever tried to? Isn't that the last enemy? Self, conceit, pride? Can you make yourself meek? No, you can make yourself a Uriah heap, but that's not meekness. Blessed are they that mourn. Blessed are the pure in heart. What rubbish to talk about practicing the Sermon on the Mount. It starts with that. Can you do it? Of course we can't do it. No natural men can do it. And the gospel is not foolish enough to ask the impossible. It knows we can't do it. Before a man can do any one of these things, he must be born again. Now, says Peter, he's addressing Christian people. He says, I'm exhorting you to love the brethren with a pure heart fervently. And you can do it because you have been born again. You've got new life. You've got new power. You've got this new vigor within you. Well, very well then. Here is my first principle, which I'm enunciating to you this evening. The gospel of Jesus Christ offers us this new birth, this new life, this new beginning. It is one of its central offers. And yet, as I'm trying to show you, the world doesn't seem to see this. Christianity is just one of a number of teachings, one of a number of philosophies. I can take up this, then I try that. I'll go the whole round of them. I'm interested in Christianity. Shall I take it up or shan't I? Your whole attitude is wrong. This starts by telling you, you must be born again. You can do nothing until you've been born again. It's basic. It is fundamental. Very well, that brings me then to the next inevitable matter, doesn't it, which is this. Why must we be born again? Why do we need this new life? Why is it only men who have been born again that can be exhorted to love the brethren with a pure heart? Well, fortunately for us, the Apostle answers all those questions in the immediate context, and I'm just going to unfold it before you this evening. You see, what we are told by the Gospel is this, that there are two births that are possible to all mankind. There is our first birth, which is our natural birth. And then there is this second birth, this rebirth, this regeneration, this being born again. And the difference between the man who is not a Christian and the man who is a Christian is this, that the man who is not a Christian has only been born once. The Christian is a man who has been born twice. Every man has had this natural birth, that's common to all of us. Yes, but at that level we are not Christian. What is a Christian? Oh, a Christian is a man who's been born again. But why is it necessary, I ask, that we should be born again? And let me give you the answer. Let us look for a moment at man as he is by nature. Man in his first birth, man in his natural birth. What is the truth about him? Well, the first thing that's true of him, says the apostle, is this. The seed of which he has been born and which has given him life is a corruptible seed. You notice his contrast? You, he says, you Christian men whom I'm exhorting to love the brethren with a pure heart fervently, you have been born again, not of corruptible seed. 
You were in your first birth, he says, born of a corruptible seed. And this, of course, is the whole heart of the matter. Why is the world as it is? Because men have been born of a corruptible seed. Why is the world full of bitterness and malice and hatred and envy and jealousy and pride and war? Why are the nations in their madness piling up their arms and proposing war? That's the question. Why? I say there's only one answer. Man by nature is born of a corruptible seed. The very germ out of which he's developed is corrupt. What do you mean by this, says someone? Well, it's expounded at very great length in the Bible. Let me put it very briefly and hurriedly to you this evening. Every one of us who is born into this world is born corrupted, born polluted. We've come out of a seed, the seed of our parents. They were corrupt, therefore we are corrupt. This is the great biblical doctrine of original sin. And remember, original sin includes original pollution. From the moment man fell as a result of his disobedience of God, his nature became corrupted and polluted. And you can see it. Look at Cain. Cain was the man he was because his father and mother had fallen. He was born fallen, and he goes on to prove it. And we've all inherited from Adam a corrupt nature of corruptible seed. We all receive it by inheritance. You say that's unfair. My dear friend, you can say what you like, but I'm simply telling you the fact. I'm simply giving you the only adequate explanation of the fact why we all are what we are and why it is that children give us uh, so much trouble. It's because they're born of a corruptible seed. You see, we're not born neutral, we're not born perfect and then go wrong. No, no, we are born sinners. In sin did my mother conceive me. Born in sin. Shapen. In iniquity, very seed which led to our birth and our growth and development, it itself was rotten. And if the seed is rotten, the fruit will be rotten. If the tree is bad, the fruit will be bad, said our Lord. It's equally true of the seed. And this is the whole explanation of the tragic story of the human race. We are all born sinners. We are born rebels. We are born unclean. It's nonsense to say that we were once absolutely pure and innocent. And then we began to hear people saying things that they shouldn't say. No, no, we were impure before we ever heard them. Of course we can add to the pollution of children. Of course we can. But I'm saying that whatever we do, whether we do nothing at all, they're already polluted, and that's why they like it. And that's why they read their books surreptitiously that they shouldn't read, and eavesdrop upon conversations that they shouldn't listen to. What makes them do it? Whence the curiosity? Whence the pleasure? Whence the delight? Ah, it's within them. The seed was corrupt. I don't want to stay with this this evening. But I'm emphasizing it as I'm doing because one still sees that the world doesn't like this doctrine and yet it can't explain itself apart from it. That natural birth of ours was of a polluted and a corrupted seed. We start with a bias toward evil within us. We all delight in sin and enjoy it. Born of a corruptible seed. Ah, yes, and as I've been saying, because the seed is corrupt, everything that comes out of it is equally corrupt. It's bound to be. It's cause and effect this, and you can't help it. 
You see, if there's poison in the sauce, it'll be in the stream. If the seed itself is wrong, everything that comes out of it must be wrong. Your modern biology emphasizes that without going any further. Your genetics teaches that. It's all a question of heredity, and sin is a matter of heredity now. When the first man fell, everybody who's come out of him has been affected by it. There is this solidarity in the human race. As by the offense of one man, says Paul in Romans 5, many were constituted sinners. And that is the simple truth. We are born of a corruptible seed. But, as I say, the consequence is that all that comes out of it shows this corruption. And so the Apostle here now gives us a description of humanity and of civilization. And here is his description. All flesh is as grass. And all the glory of men as a flower of grass. What a terribly, devastatingly true description. All the glory of man as the flower of grass. Oh, yes, it can look very beautiful. It can make a wonderful show. It can be most impressive at first sight until you begin to look at it. And oh, you begin to see how transient, how passing it is, and how superficial it all is. And this is his description. Of the glory of men, and how true it is. Now let me work it out with you just a little. I want to emphasize its superficial character, its temporary character. And let me do so from the very words that are implied by the Apostle himself in this first chapter. Listen to this. For as much as he knows, says the Apostle, that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation, vain conversation, received by tradition from your father. Now there it is all so perfectly, isn't it? What is this conversation? And remember, conversation in the scripture means walk or kind of life or manner or mode of living. He says it's a vain conversation received by tradition from your father. Ah, oh, yes. Here's natural history, isn't it? Here is the natural man. He's born into the world, into this great and marvelous and thrilling world. And what does he begin to do? He goes to school and he begins to learn. What does he learn about the glory of man? Kings, princes, great empires, conquests, art, literature, music, drama, all these things, the glory of man. He enters into this heritage. He receives it by tradition from his fathers. And the father and the mother think the greatest and the best thing they can do for this child is to introduce him to this glory. That's their supreme ambition for it. Give him this knowledge. Let him be a partaker of this glory. But what is it all? Well, says the Apostle Peter, it is vain conversation. And vain means empty. Vain means finally useless. Vain means this, that there's nothing in it. There's no body there. It looks marvelous. But it only looks marvelous. It is unutterably superficial. Oh, Shakespeare has a habit, you know, in his own way of putting these things very perfectly. He puts it, you remember, in a great and famous passage that men seeking this glory, this glory of men that the Apostle is talking about, he says, seeking the bubble, reputation, even in the cannon's mouth. The bubble, reputation, cutting a figure on the stage of life, leading men in society, leading men in a profession, leading men in a business, leading men in an army. The bubble, reputation. The great men of the world 
what is it all? Well, says Shakespeare even, it's a bubble. It's very beautiful. It's like an iridescent bubble. It's got all the colors of the rainbow in it. But how marvelous, you say. Yes, how insubstantial, I reply. It can burst in a moment and it's gone. Vain conversation. Isn't it about time that we began to recognize and to see these things? In spite of all our learning and knowledge and wealth and glory and all the things of which we boast, look at our world. Why is it as it is? Because all that is vain. I'm not here to denounce knowledge and culture as such, but I am here to say this, that all the knowledge of the world and of all mankind and all the culture of the ages cannot deal with the problem of man. And you and I are living in a terrible age of crisis when we are seeing the vanity, the emptiness, the futility, the bubble character of all the glory of which the world talks so much. Think of the intellectuals who would despise us tonight because we are spending our time like this. The intellectuals, the intelligentsia, who wouldn't dream of considering this gospel or listening to its preaching. But they're great intellectuals. What's the value of their intellect to them? What is it teaching them about the art of living and of being pure and clean and straight and true? And holy. No, no, it's a vain conversation. It's a bubble reputation. It is empty. It is worthless. But that's not the only thing he says about it. He says another thing. There is something worse. Listen to what he says in verse 13 and 14. Wherefore he says, Gird up the lines of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you with the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts. That's it. That's the way of the world. That's what this corrupt seed leads to always, your former lusts. That's the kind of life that is being lived by the man who's only had that first birth from Adam and from his parents, from that corruptible seed. His life, his behavior is one of lust. Lusting for the gratification of inordinate desires. Sexual food and drink and all the things he wants to possess and to have. Lusts. The corrupt seed leads to corrupt practice. The whole world tonight is full of this lust and passion and desire and greed and envy and this lack of control and this hatred of discipline. Lust, of course, a corrupt seed is bound to lead to this sort of thing. The fruit must be corrupt, and it is. But not only that, says the apostle, he's got one further word. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. Ignorance. And I suppose finally that is the most devastating thing in the last analysis about this corruptible seed of which we are born. It means that we are born blind. It means that the faculty of vision is not there. The seed has been corrupted. That gene that determines vision was vitiated by the fall and we are born blind. The God of this world has blinded the mind of them that believe not. We are born in darkness. We are blind to God and to spiritual reality. We are unaware of the soul and its importance. We are unaware of Christ and his glory. We can't see. We are ignorant. And the world is dying of ignorance tonight. And it's ignorant, I say, because the seed of which it has been born was corrupt at the very beginning. And the result of all this is, as these men in the Bible go on putting it, that though we may try to live a good life out of this first birth of ours, it only comes to this. 
All your righteousnesses are but as filthy rags. Oh, listen to Paul putting it in his case. There he was before his conversion. There he was when he was only born of his father and mother in Tarsus, the seed of Adam. Here he is, living a good moral religious life. And yet what does he say of it when he's born again? It is dung, it is refuse, it is utter loss. It is empty, it is vain, it is bubble. I've got a great reputation, he said. I excelled over all my contemporaries. He came to see that it was but the bubble reputation of Shakespeare, that it was of no value at all. And then the third and the last thing that we are told here about this corrupted, corruptible seed is that it is to be destroyed. All flesh is as grass, and all the glory of men is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. Of course it does. It was only there for a moment. It doesn't last. It's got no seed in it to keep it going. It doesn't endure. Even at the moment you're looking at it, it's beginning to wither. Pluck it out of the grass, and in a moment it's faded, and it's dead the next day, as our Lord puts it. It is like the grass that today is, and tomorrow is cast into the furnace. Even when we are admiring it, it is withering. Don't lay up for yourselves, says Christ, treasures on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. The greatest things the world can give us, and all its glory, has got a seed of decay in it. The rottenness, the corruptibility was there from the moment that it was implanted. And so we can join with the writer of the hymn and look out upon life and say, Earth's joys grow dim. Uh, its glories pass away and they're passing away even while we look at them but that isn't the end of the story because it is corrupt it is to be destroyed God the judge eternal is righteous and so when I go back to Isaiah chapter 40 out of which the apostle is here quoting I find a phrase that Peter doesn't quote, but he implies it. Listen to this in Isaiah 40, verse 7. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. And it vanishes and disappears and is destroyed. The grass withereth, the flower thereof falleth away. And that is the story of all the glory of men. This world in which people pride themselves so much. And of its glories they sing so much. You know, the day is coming when God in judgment will just blow upon it. And it will have gone and leave not a rack behind. The writer of the first psalm had already seen it. The ungodly, he says, are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. That man, according to his first birth, the very seed was corrupt. And all that comes out of it is corrupt and vain and empty and lustful and sinful. And it will be withered away and blown to nothing by the Spirit of the Lord and will end in everlasting destruction. That is why man needs to be born again. Because his first birth was a corrupt, sinful, vile, and rotten birth. And then that leads me to my last word. 
which is this. The nature of the new birth. Have you been following me? Have you realized your nature is vile and polluted? And that you need a new nature, that you must be born again for the reasons I've been adducing. Very well, says the gospel. You can be. This is my message. I'm not asking you to attempt the impossible. I know you can't do it. I'll give you a new life. I'll give you a new birth. There is another seed. Being born again. Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. By the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. What's this message? Let me but summarize it as I close. This is something that we cannot do for ourselves. You can't give birth to yourself. You can't give yourself a new nature. You can't get yourself this seed that is pure and clean and holy. Go and try it and you'll fail. You never can. Men have tried it and have failed. And they've all agreed in confessing not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demand. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? Impossible. And a man cannot give birth to himself. To be born again means that the Holy Spirit operates upon you. That the Spirit of God that brooded over the chaos at the beginning and brought order into the chaos and thereby introduced creation should enter into your soul with all its darkness and chaos and all its corruptibility, and begin to operate. That's Christianity, being born again. The maker, the creator of the universe, taking hold of your soul, and remaking it, remodeling it, refashioning it, putting the new spirit of life into it, putting a new principle of being into it. That's what's meant by the new birth. Of his own will, I quote James again, Beget he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And it means just this that an entirely new principle of life is put in, a new seed is put in. He that is born of God sinneth not, says John, he for he cannot. Why? His seed remaineth in him. He's got a new seed in him. And what is the nature of the new sea? Well, the answer is, of course, it is the exact opposite of the old. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. What's he talking about? Did you know what he's talking about? Can you answer the question? Let me tell you, in case you, that you're in this ignorance that he's speaking of. Incorruptible seed. What is this? The corruptible seed that's in us all by nature. I know I've got that from Adam. It's come down by inheritance from my fathers, my forefathers. Back I go to Adam, the first man who fell and who became corrupt. I know where I've got that from. It's from man and fallen men. Where does this other seed come from? This incorruptible seed. It's almost incredible, isn't it? But you know, it comes from God. I tell you again that in his second epistle, chapter 1, verse 4, Peter says, we are made partakers of the divine nature. The life of God in the souls of men. The life of Christ coming into us. A new seed. Uh, an incorruptible seed. Yes, the purity of the Godhead, the purity of the divinity, the seed of Christ, born of God, becoming children of God, sons of God, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ who becomes our elder brother. This is Christianity, my friend. This is the thing that makes it possible for you to live a good life. Not you yourself as you are, you can't do it. But given this life of Christ, I live yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Very well then, I can face even the Sermon on the Mount. 
an incorruptible seed, partakers of the divine nature. No longer born of men, born from above, born of the Spirit, born of God, and made a child of God and a member of the family of God, the life of God in my soul. That's Christianity. And without this, you cannot hope to live the Ten Commandments and the Sermon on the Mount and all that the Bible demands. But with this you can. And secondly, it's not only an incorruptible seed. Oh, there's a principle of growth in this. This isn't like the grass of the field that today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven. This isn't something superficial and light and empty and like a bubble. No, no. What's this? Oh, there is life here. I say again, the life of God. And what does the Bible compare it to? To a babe, not to a flower. Babe. Next chapter, chapter 2, Peter says, as newborn babes. It's the difference between a man and a bit of grass or a flower. Life, solid, real, lasting, developing. Grow in grace, he says and in the knowledge of the Lord, and you can, the Word of God. It is not like the grass that is something that liveth and abideth, goes on living forever. Indeed, it is everlasting. For the life that we are given as the result of the implanting of this new seed in us, by the word of God, is something which is called here life eternal, everlasting life, endless life. You know, even the old psalmist had had a glimpse of it. Listen to Psalm 92. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. If you're planted in the house of God, you're not going to be thrown to the oven the next day. No, no. You'll flourish in heaven. And in addition, they shall still bring forth fruit in old age. You can't say that about the world. When people in the world get old, they're finished. They're relying upon things that are decaying. They don't bring forth fruit in old age. Their old age is miserable and lonely and sour and despairing. But these shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. That's Psalm 92. Oh, yes. This is eternal and everlasting life. Nothing can destroy it. Produce your bombs, produce your inferno, if you like. It doesn't matter. The man who has this seed in him has been brought again, as Peter told us in verse 3, unto a lower begottenness again, unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To what? to an inheritance, to a life which is incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. The life that comes out of this new seed, this seed of God, is imperishable, is indestructible. And when the world vanishes in the final judgment and the last manifestation of the wrath of God, it will be there flourishing and standing out in all its glory and in all its perfection. In the presence of God, with exceeding joy. The two seeds you see. 
are all together and entirely different. My dear friend, as I leave you, I've only one question to put to you, obviously. Have you been born again? You've got the first birth, we've all got it. And you know its sinfulness and its corruption. The question I'm asking you is this. Have you been born again? How can I tell, says someone, when Peter gives us the answer? As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. Do you like reading your Bible? Do you enjoy it? Do you find food for your soul? If you don't, I doubt whether you've ever been born again. The babe likes the milk. Have you been born again? If you haven't, confess it to God. Ask Him to have mercy upon you. Ask Him to give you life on you. Go to Him as you are in your sin at this moment. Tell Him you see your vileness and your rottenness, that you're a child of the first birth only. And ask him to have pity and compassion and he'll tell you that he will. He'll tell you that he sent his son to die for you and your sins and that he by his precious blood has redeemed you. He will tell you that by his spirit he will give you new life. Ask him for it. Say to him, breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with life on me that I may love what thou dost love, and do what thou wouldst do. Go to him, make no tarrying. One of our beloved sidesmen was here with us a week tonight, here on my left in the gallery. He's in glory at this minute. He died without warning, suddenly on Tuesday morning. What if that should happen to you? Or if you go to death, with only that corruptible seed, that first birth, it means destruction like the flower of the grass of the field. Make certain that you have the new birth, the new life, that you're born again, that you are a partaker of the divine nature. Go on as our beloved brother has gone beyond any question. He was even longing to go at times to an inheritance which is incorruptible. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.